Hi, welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm Catherine Clark. Ontario Conservative MP Rick Norlock was destined for the priesthood, if his parents had anything to say about it. But a chance side trip to an OPP recruitment center changed the course of his life, and he served with the OPP for 30 years. He was recruited by the Canadian Alliance to run in the 2000 federal election. He did, and he lost. But he won in 2006, and he continues to serve in the House of Commons. Rick Norlock joins me now to talk about life beyond politics. Rick Norlock, welcome to Beyond Politics. It's great to have you here. And it's great to be here. Well, I thank you for taking the time. You know, I thought I'd start by asking you about your mom and dad because I'd heard that your dad was a lumberjack. Is that yeah, true? Uh, yes, he uh, started uh, back in the late 20s, early 30s at 13 years of age no, during the Depression. Really? Uh, assisting his father, who was a teamster, yep. meaning he had the team of horses and my dad helped him out. Uh, so that was his, if, if, if he were alive today, he would say that was the love of his life work-wise. Okay. He's uh, in the bush, northern Ontario, with a crosscut saw with his two brothers. Uh, it sounds, when I talk to high school kids, it sounds as though I'm ancient, but he actually did, he and his two brothers, build the houses, uh, build the log cabins that, uh, that they brought their brides to in northern Ontario. And, wow. Uh, it, uh, I have some pictures to prove it to the grandkids. Do you really? Are the houses still in the family? Uh, uh, the, oh, those, they don't exist They're anymore. Long gone. It used to, the history was you'd build a sawmill, cut, you know, cut the bush that was commercially okay. uh, viable, and then you moved on somewhere else and they built a little railway spur. So most of those houses just deteriorated. And I, I went to where the houses were and there's really not much there anymore. Isn't that something though? Mm -hmm. um, you said it, if you'd asked him that that would have been the work-wise the love of his life. Yep. Um, did he go on to do something else then? Yes, after uh, my brother was born, I'm the eldest of six kids, and after, uh, after my this number two was born, uh, in those days we were getting, of course, we were, I'd be about three or four years old, so you were getting close to school age and because there were sort of mobile communities, there wasn't really much in the way of infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, on Sunday night, you put your children on the train, and they would go to boarding school, and you would get them back on Friday evening or Friday afternoon. Right. So my dad didn't think that was a good way to raise a family. Uh, he came from a large family and intended to have a large family, which he did. So we moved to the Ottawa Valley here, just uh, and Dad went to work as a laborer in, the, in an open pit magnesium mine near Renfrew, and right. that's my hometown, is, is the town is of Renfrew. Renfrew. Okay, mm -hmm. and your mom, what, uh, how did they meet? What did uh, your mom well, do they my met? mom's dad was a trapper and a filer in a sawmill, and she's a Northern Ontario, Franco-Ontarian, and uh, dad just happened to meet her at one of those little dances, and uh, uh, I think he proposed, that they were, she was 18 when she got married, 19 when I was born, it sounds today like you were robbing the crate, but in those <laughs> days, that, uh, that, that was, was the, the average age, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, yes, we ended up in the Upper Ottawa Valley, and Dad progressed in his uh, work and worked his way from basically just general labor to, uh, to a welder and then to a millwright, and then ended his uh, working life there as uh, superintendent in charge of maintenance. Huh. And I suppose that, uh, and he was very involved in his, in his union, the United Steelworkers of America, uh, and he also did some uh, uh, some union organizing, so different plants he would drive to. So he was a, a trade unionist, and uh, I can recall the time he made an announcement in the living room that he was going to Ottawa to found a political party for the working man, and that was the NDP. So, Wow. Uh, so, so how did you end up a conservative? Uh, well, you, I, uh, let's just say uh, I accredit uh, Bob Ray for that, actually. <laughs> okay. Uh, being the Premier of Ontario, yeah. and uh, I'm told not to say these things, but th they're, the, they're the facts, they're yeah. the truth. I right. voted for him the first time, and, and I must say that uh, didn't think uh, he did a very good job, and didn't really think of politics, followed my father's yeah. advice, and uh, you know, I thought my dad was a great guy, loved him. And sure. So politics was minor in my life at that time. Policing was all-encompassing, so mm -hmm. I took my political lead from my father, as most, as yeah, many, yeah, not yeah, most, course. but many Canadians do. Right. And then got to thinking about politics after uh, my kids were older, and certain things were happening in my life, and 
I reassessed who I was, what, what I believed in, yes. and found out I was a conservative and sent now, away for membership in the Reform Party. Was your dad alive um, uh, when he'd made the decision? Uh, yeah, yes. Of that politically you did Yeah, didn't but it wasn't. Scene. No, it wasn't a. I just a wondered real, if you'd had it. It wasn't know. a real big deal to him at that time because sure. I was still a policeman, right? Sure. And I was uh, the boy who, uh, you know, who was doing things that he wasn't raised to do. In other words, we <laughs> were. There were certain things in my life, organizations I belonged to. Yeah. Uh, he was a Knight of Columbus. I became a Mason. Uh, those were <laughs> little things. He wondered what, what was going on there. But uh, So I sort of drifted away from the path that, let's just say, I was, I was, they had designs on me uh, uh, to be the priest of the family. And, uh, wow, as the eldest, of as course. As the eldest of six right. and a boy. And yeah. I was sent to, uh, to Catholic school when Catholic schools weren't fully funded in Ontario. Yes. And so dad, uh, dad sent me to the local Catholic school in Renfrew. And, did yeah. they hope you would become this, or I, did I they see something in Well, I think they you? were sort of pushing me along those lines, because my yeah. other brothers and sisters went to the public high school, right? So, so there was a design This was a there. fairly blatant uh, push yeah, pretty well. then. Yeah. But, uh, did they say it to you? Didn't, mm, I don't recall okay. quite like that, but they would always say that I had a you know, you have a more of a sense of responsibility and blah, blah, and yeah. those sorts of things. And, of course... Which come with being the eldest of six. Yeah. Well, I helped raise two of my brothers, but uh, mm -hmm. actually when I left home, they were, uh, I think, six and seven years old. So we got to rekindle our relationship uh, at a later time. Sure. More like brother. They were more like cousins for a while. Yes. But, uh, but that changed uh, when my dad was leaving this world uh, we did a vigil in his, by his bedside and yeah. got to spend a lot of time together with my youngest brother who works in Ottawa here oh, nice. uh, for the Ottawa Sun. And so anyways, to make a long story short, um, we're very, I'm very family oriented. Yeah. And uh, so we, uh, we had some very interesting discussions, my dad and I, but, I but always respectful and we respect each other's opinion. Yeah. And that's the way it should be, right? When you were a kid as the eldest of six and it would have been a really busy household, um, did you have special responsibilities that... Uh, well, let's just say that when I had my kids, my wife's a registered nurse, yes. and uh, sometimes nurses, uh, they're good mothers, but uh, some things they don't know. So I would be holding the kid, and she'd say, oh, be careful, be careful. I said, kids have... Bendy, Malleable bend, brains? <laughs> bendy, bendable bones okay. for a reason, just they jokingly. Bounce. So when my brothers and sisters were younger, I did the laundry, you know, cleaned the diapers, made formula, did all those things that uh, bode well for me when I was, when I had, we had our children because my kids didn't have flushable or flushable diapers as they call them. Yeah. We, had, we had flannel diapers and uh, diaper pails and all that because I just thought they were better. Yeah. I don't know if they are, but I thought they were. So right. you do what you're, what comes natural, right? And that's, that's actually very interesting because not a lot of dads have an opinion. Not a lot of dads think, okay, well, we're going to choose these. It's usually the mom who say. Uh, yeah, I've got a news flash for, I, I, you know, somebody called me and I didn't know what it meant. As a young police officer, they called me metrosexual. I thought it was an insult, but I really think in this day and age, uh, the divisions between whose responsibility this is, or that's up to the couple themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, people decide. I, I have no qualms about taking the vacuum and washing out the toilet and stuff. Uh, you know, dishwashers, I, I wouldn't use the dishwasher as often as my wife, but it's, uh, we, you know, after 40 years, we, we know wh where, we, where we should be doing this and yes. we should be doing that. With this job, that's all changed, of course. Sure. I used to do the outside work, and yeah. now my wife does some gardening, and I always say she's not killing the plants anymore. They're actually starting to live. If she sees this, she'll be... She'll laugh, hopefully. <laughs> you hope she'll laugh. Hopefully. Yes, yeah, <laughs> you hope. Um, did you like having a big family as a kid? Yes, I did. And uh, uh, without uh, getting into any domestic issues between my wife and I, yeah. I, I was hoping for four kids. We had two. Yeah. And after the second one, my wife said, that's it. And yeah. I think you kind of have to go with that when that happens mm -hmm. in a family. Absolutely. Because otherwise, Absolutely. the it's other person may not make it through. Well, we're, you're both adults, right? Yeah. And the agreements you made before. I, jokingly often said, you know, I remember our wedding vows, love, honor, and obey. I said, you love me, you honor me. It's the obey part yeah. I'm not sure of. But, uh, yeah. but, but, you know, that's, you don't get to be together for 40 years and, uh, and not begin to know where to back off and, sure. you know, where each to other's compromise. strengths. And, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
You know, um, after the priesthood uh, was not a ringing success uh, as a potential career choice for you, um, did you go right to policing or did mm, you have another? Actually, policing would have been the last thing my friends or I would have considered. Um, Is that I because wasn't, you were a crazy youth? Mm, well, I, people would have said just the opposite of oh, that. Oh, okay. And uh, I, I worked part-time at the a local A&P yeah. store and decided that uh, I wasn't going to go to college or university, that I was going to be the best manager the A&P ever had. So uh, when I graduated uh, from grade 13, I uh, went to work in Pembroke uh, for the A&P. And uh, let's just say one, after our exams in grade 13, you know, Renfrew's close to the Quebec border. And yes. The drinking age is different. Lower. And uh, so three of my buddies and I were heading across after the last exam to, uh, to have a celebration on the other side of the Ottawa River. Yes. And three of them decided, or three of them had wanted to be police officers. So they went inside the local OPP detachment. I was sitting out in the car and it was a June day, rather hot. So the windows were down and I was getting sweaty. And one of the guys yelled out from the, hey, it's air conditioned in here. Come on, sit inside. So I went inside. One of the corporals happened to, uh, I happened to chum around with uh, a neighbor of his, and he basically leaned across the desk, and, or leaned across the counter and said, Norwalk, you should put your application in too. So I thought, well, why not? I'm sitting there, right? And uh, I guess about eight months later, uh, when I was working at the AMP, and I wasn't, let's just say that uh, I was working really hard, but I thought my efforts were not being appropriately appreciated. And I got a phone call uh, that... Uh, they had gone through the applications, and would I be still interested in the Ontario wow. Provincial Police? And wow. That's how I got involved. That's amazing. And you, you didn't question it at that point. You thought, well, this Well, I was, I was having, uh, let's just say I didn't like the managerial style of the person I was working I loved the manager in Renfrew. Yeah. He was a proper motivator. Just, yeah. I was just working very hard to be the best employee and yeah. didn't think that, uh, that my extra efforts were being appreciated and thought, hey... I'll give it a try, like sure. policing, give it a try for a year or so, it'll look yeah. good on my resume, sure. right? And uh, f basically worked hard to be a, a police officer and fell in love with the job and it was one of the 30 wonderful years. That's really excellent. What, um, when you first became an officer and when you were in training, uh, so I guess when you were in training and then you first became an officer, did you, was there something in particular that really gelled for you about well I had a it was it was sort of rough at first you know I had a baptism of fire I'm sort of a protected Ottawa Valley kid yes uh, basically a very shy person uh, but my job with the NP you I had you you had to meet people right and do you have this and so yeah. the interaction so I got out of my sort of shell you might say yeah. uh, policing you really have to get out of your shell uh, and so I uh, how so because well, my impression and, and I think for a lot of people who um, don't have regular dealings with the police is that um, for the most part people are hopefully a bit more respectful and you know they do mm. what you tell them to do is that not generally the case well what it what it to me what it is is usually when you're in the retail business yes you are friendly you are doing good things you're not you want to please people, whereas as a policeman, the pleasing part is secondary to the, shall we say, the law enforcement part. So uh, traffic generally was what I was doing. The Hawkesbury detachment at the time was very traffic oriented. It was, you know, we worked the killer strip, which was between Ottawa and the Quebec border because it was a two lane highway. This was back in the early 70s. And then, and then after the, um, you know, after the Olympics, it was a four lane highway on the, on the Quebec side. So we had one of the highest fatality rates in Canada per, per mile at the time. Uh, so you had to, the negative thing for me is I came from a, a, work, a lower working, blue collar working class family, so I didn't have a lot of driving experience. So here I am uh, trying to negotiate at high speeds through traffic. And let's just say I had to uh, drive all the time, I had to practice off time. Uh, I boarded with another police officer because I, I I, I like a family atmosphere, yeah. so he had a young family. Uh, I sort of fit in there, and I helped babysit his kids, and be, you know, so sure. I, you know, uh, sort of the family thing. But Felt he more like helped home me. in a way too. Absolutely, yeah. 
And so he and I worked together to improve my driving skills. But getting back from a personal perspective and relationship with other people, so mm -hmm. policing is a different relationship. Today, even today, it's a little bit different. The story I like I liked to refer to, you know, and I say this for the parents out there, is don't use the policeman as the big bad guy. I remember when I was in Campbellford Detachment, as a supervisor there, a mother came in with two of her young children, probably six, seven, eight years old, and I guess they were misbehaving. She brought them in, and she wanted me to put them behind bars to oh, show no. them what it's like if you don't behave. And <laughs> she I, must have been having a really bad day. She, well, she and I had a little discussion that the policeman should be looked at as as the person you go to when you you know when you're when you're in trouble or to go to for help we're not the big bad policeman we're the we're officer friendly right uh, so she and I and I sat down with the kids and we had a little talk and so the, the the children relaxed and I said now you'll never probably see this again she was insistent that they see this out don't ask me why and you know you want to please but <clears throat> we, we, we did it in the right context and when those children left I think they Hopefully they had the right attitude. Yeah. And so I say to parents, don't threaten your kids with a policeman. Your children should want to go to a policeman in a time of need, not sure. be afraid of them. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, you also raised the uh, fact that you did a lot of the traffic work and that you were seeing fatalities. As a young person, did that have an impact on you as well? Absolutely. Uh, here's a... This is sort of the baptism of fire. One of the first fatalities I went to was a very young, and this has to do with smoking for the folks out there to see the value of not smoking, was a young gentleman, probably 19 or 21 years old, uh, was basically a suicide fatality and in close to one of our little villages. And uh, anyways, part of the, they don't do it much today, but you had, in those days you went to the postmortem. So my coach officer said, you're lucky, you're going to go to a, excuse the vulgar terms, but a fresh one, right? Mm -hmm. you, somebody that's not been in the Ottawa River, which I also did for quite some time. Yeah. And so, you know, the smells that you, you go through. So uh, as a young man, being somewhat protected in life and then seeing another human being basically go through a postmortem. But, yeah. uh, but I was very fortunate in that I had a pathologist who talked me through it. Right. Uh, and uh, showed me the lungs, and he said, now this young fellow didn't smoke very much, and you could see the black spots. So I was, yeah. in my youth, I always tried to smoke, but I could never <laughs> smoke because I would get sick. Yeah. It, it bothered me then because that was part of being the mature guy, right? right? In the Ottawa Valley is and no filters, but never did work for me, so I never did smoke. But uh, that, if I was disposed to want to, that sure dissuaded me. And I bet. So it is though, it's those experience uh, going to your, when you're on your own, going to a fatal snowmobile accident, having the mother there, having not seen the accident, but in the same village, saying, officer, do something. And you know there's not much you can do, uh, but you, so I started CPR and, the, you know, the smell of blood on the breath, but you did it because mom and dad are there and the neighbors are there you have to do something yeah even though you know when you're doing the compressions you can feel the crushing and but you do it because you know they just want some help right and that's and that's the thing about the the thing about policing and in politics that that really impressed me or that that is that's important to me and that's helping people even though sometimes you don't think what you're doing is that important yeah. or I shouldn't say that important that it's achieving the results, right. you're doing something because people want you to help them in their time of need. And you get that in politics and we got and I, that in policing. So I always, in policing, wanted, looked at my helping more than anything else. I had, and people think you're, you're, uh, you're not quite truthful when you say this, I had more letters when I left Hawkesbury Detachment of people thanking me for giving them a ticket or stopping them really than the other way around no kidding and I can recall this uh, this one letter he was a minister actually and he sent me a letter saying you know I didn't realize I was speeding that day officer and you may have saved my life and so you know, just it it doesn't make you feel good because you gave somebody a ticket but you you understand that people get it right that the rules are there for a reason right and 
I always used to use the, uh, use the uh, hockey game analogy, we're Canadian, right? <laughs> A. And uh, I always say, you know, look at the policeman as the referee, and today you got caught elbowing. You know, you made an improper pass or you were speeding. Think of the number of times you did that and you weren't caught. So, yeah. you know, suck it up, take your penalty, and, go and, on. and learn. Now, does it impact the way, or, and does it still, but did it impact the way that you lived your life as well? Um, like, were you a more cautious driver, uh, a, a better law abider? I mean, would you really well, follow I, the Well, I wouldn't want to go that far. I, <laughs> my kids would tell me today I drive like an old man. But, uh, um, no, I, uh, let me just say that it does change your personality. And the reason I say that is about a, I guess about two and a half years, I think it was before I, I married my wife, Judy, uh, I was at home and I don't know if it was the language I was using or I, you didn't swear around my mother if my father was nearby. You, you just didn't swear. I mean, it just was. And my mom just, I remember we were having supper and she said, you're not the boy I raised. And I think she meant that I had changed, mm -hmm. that policing had changed. And my, and, and, and my father had made reference to that. It was always sort of the, I guess, I wouldn't say timid. Because it makes you tougher? I, I just, yeah, more outgoing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess you lived up to the mach a little bit more macho words before I was more reserved. Right. And, uh, I, I, I'll let other people tell you what I was like. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just think I was just a, just just a different person yeah. because of the way I was raised, the school I went to, and uh, yeah, those sorts sorts of things. There's got to be a lack. Um, well, there's got to be an, an adrenaline drop from politics. Uh, you've, got, you've come from policing into politics. Yeah, not necessarily. Really? Oh, absolutely not. You know, folks have said that. Like, what? It's not the what got you into politics. It's the. I always say it's it's the helping. It's you know, the good part about being a member of parliament is you're usually for your constituents the last resort. Mm -hmm. They've gone through the bureaucratic. You know, they've gone to Service Canada. They've done all the things that the book says you have to do. Either whether it's a, employment insurance or, you know, your uh, child benefits or, or whatever it is, or, you know, your CPP, whatever. Uh, and then they come to you and you shake the, you know, shake the tree and you go to the person who makes the decision. And, and oftentimes, uh, at least more than, at least 50% of the time, we achieve, or, or better, we achieve some positive results for the constituent. Not necessarily 100%. Sometimes it's only 10 or 15 or 20 percent, but it's something better. And sometimes it's just the fact that you were prepared to roll up your sleeves and work with them, even though in the end they didn't qualify for it. So in policing, it's helping people in time of need. You know, my car was stolen. I need, you know, just to be there, reassure the person or in an accident scene, helping people, you know, waiting for the ambulance or the tow truck. Uh, so it's all helping people. It's all public service. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it comes somewhat naturally to me, I think, in those ways. Uh, the, other, the other is, I, I guess some people say the, the, uh, you have to take orders and things. Well, policemen, you know, you're part of a team. Well, politically, you're part of a team. And it doesn't matter what team you're on. Right. I always, and I say this at committee, you know, when, when, the, you know, when the cameras are on, everybody does their thing, right? The speaking points, all that. But when the committee's actually down to work and you get the politics out, we're all there in the best interest of Canadians. We just have different ways of getting to where sure. we want to go. Sure. When you were a kid, did you think you'd end up as a policeman or a Abs member of Parliament? Absolutely not. Uh, I'll, I'll just... The first time you're here as a member of Parliament, um, I mean, you're in awe. The shock is still there, right? But I remember when it first dawned on me, and I, I'll be careful not to use the same word I thought I said to myself, I was walking up Elgin Street. It was a day not too dissimilar to today. It probably was the winter. It was a warm, rainy, or a cold, damp, rainy day. You know, typical Ottawa yeah. day where the, where the dampness gets right into your bones. Sure. I had a hat on uh, because I need a hat. <laughs> and I was just walking by the, by the gates, just getting past East Lock. And there was a young family... They were an Asian family. And the father was explaining to the kids, this is the Parliament of Canada, and this is where... And, and I just heard a few words as I walked by. And, of course, it's blowing, so I had held my hat down and I looked up. And I just said, oh, 
my holy I work there. Yeah. This is where I work. Like it just hit me then. This is this is important stuff. You have you better you better do the best job you can because uh, you made some commitments here, and if you don't, you're not going to be here for very long. How did your family react when you said that you were going to run? Uh, I, well, I ran because my wife told me I should just say yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, but that's... Just get on with it? But, but in my... <clears throat> you know, sometimes you're... Uh, and I say this now because I truly believe it. Sometimes your path in life is chosen for you. Now, whether it's circumstances, it, what, it, what, what your belief systems are. The involvement in politics, uh, the involvement in policing was just somebody saying, you should put in an application. The involvement in politics, I came, I had been talking about, thinking about retirement at year 29 in my, my days and uh, had gone to some, a couple of fundraisers, provincial fundraisers. And just as a, you know, because I had changed, you know, and my friends just happened to be going and saying, you should come and, you know, yeah. you, you believe in, it's at, the, at the time, it was the Harris yeah. government. Yeah. So um, I got a phone call coming home from work one night, or I had just walked in the door. I remember this just like yesterday. You remember certain things in your life. And I never indicated a desire, never thought of, nor indicated a desire to run for public office. And a phone call came in, and, or I received a phone call from Bert, a friend of ours. I had kicked him out of a meeting once, and he thought that was pretty good that somebody had that. Guts, I was going to use another word, guts to kick him out of a meeting. And, uh, and I guess he was, yeah, was involved in the community, various service clubs and things. And anyways, uh, I can remember my wife was at the, uh, at the stove, probably reheating supper. And uh, so Bert was on the phone and he said, uh, basically, you know, a couple of us have been talking and you sh we're hoping you, say you would put your name in to run for the Canadian Alliance. And I thought, where is this guy? So I, just a minute, Bert. So I put my hand over the receiver and I said, Judy, can you imagine blah, blah. She said, I remember she looked down, she looked and she said, why don't you just say yes? So I said, sure, okay, Bert. <laughs> Hung up the phone. Five minutes into our meal, pretty quiet, not too much said. And I said, oh my God, what did I just do? And my wife says, ah, just, you know, just see where it goes. See where it goes. Well, see, took the words, of you, the wisdom of your wife. Uh, to get you, uh, <laughs> well, I don't like to say it too often, but <laughs> if you're a smart man, you do listen to your wife, right? Yeah. Wait, tell me, um, in the end, uh, what's the best part of being an MP for you? Uh, again, I go back. It sounds like a broken record, but it's just plain helping people. Yeah. Uh, doing the best job you can for the people that put you there. You don't and miss I, policing. Uh, that's you know that's, that's a behind different me question. now. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 behind me now. It's over a, over yeah. a dozen years. Um, but my last day on the job was presenting my son with his badge. So there is a Norlock still wearing that's a uniform nice. there. That's nice. That's nice. My youngest son, yes. So. I really appreciate that you would take the time to be here. It's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to chat with you. Thank you. It was great to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.